welcome again to the official Cyblogs podcast. I'm Elf. I'm Amy. And today we have our usual strange and sultry collection <laughs> of, I, I like to use a different word each week, um, science articles from across the globe, uh, with particular reference to Cyblogs. So without further blather from me, let's just jump into it. Indeed. Uh, uh, Elf, what have you got? I believe you're beginning today. Yes, uh, today's first article is just a wee bit of national pride that's been floating around on te interwebs <laughs> for um, the past week. And that was because a New Zealander um, by the name of Rolf Olsen was the first amateur astronomer to capture a planetary disk of material surrounding an adjacent star. The star in question is called Beta Pictoris, and the reason he's the first amateur astronomer to do it is because all professional astronomers thought it was impossible. So good stuff there, Rolf. <laughs> Indeed. But it turned out not to have been, and in fact even Rolf was discouraged by a paper he read um, that was published a few years ago saying the sort of thing wasn't impossible. But uh, how did he do it? Off. Want to fill us in? Uh, yeah, he actually used a, a pretty common technique. Well, it's common to professional astronomers, not so much to amateurs. Essentially, what he did, uh, the problem with, with photographing a planetary disk is that it's very, very dim, uh, especially when it's right next to a really bright star, like Beta Pictoris, which is uh, the star this one is around. So what Rolf did is he took a photographic image of the star, and then he took another photographic image of where he thought something might be around the star. And instead of just overlaying one over the other, he actually subtracted the two away from each other, and he looked at the difference between them. And so because the, the focus was, um, wasn't was so different for the star in between the two images, most of the light and the background from the star actually got bled out of the resultant photograph. And what you see is this gorgeous little smudge of what is protoplanetary material hmm. from an amateur astronomer. Hmm. So, uh, yeah, good for him. I mean, it takes, certainly takes a lot of patience. It apparently took him a few hours over a few days to process the image. But uh, it's, it's, it's been the cause of sort of international news and, and joy. Absolutely. It's, it's fantastic. The, the star itself is uh, a little over 60 light years away, so it's, it's very close in the cosmic term of things, which is the only reason an amateur astronomer could have found it. But just... Good on him for doing it. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But also, um, and, and we'll be talking about this more in various ways over the podcast, the way that um, increasingly good technology is enabling people to get back involved in science and scientific discoveries without needing, you know, the, the, the huge education, 10 years for a PhD and the millions of dollars worth of equipment that only a large institution could, in, could afford. Uh, more and more people are, can, can sort of be a part of it in a way that, that we saw at the beginning of, of the modern scientific age. Indeed, and you can even get like people uh, like Amy and I into science, which is really quite remarkable when you think about it. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. So, uh, yeah, congratulations. Um, now, the next one is more a sort of, this isn't so much pride as, as enormous amounts of face palming and head desking. Um, I don't know if, if our listeners would have seen, but, but all over the international press uh, this week erupted the story about, you know, they're, they're alive, these giant insects that live in New Zealand, they're the biggest insects in the world. Uh, they're talking about wetters, of course, which are not newsworthy to anybody who lives in New Zealand, but which apparently the rest of the world didn't know anything about. Well, certainly according to the tenor of these articles. And what happened was um, uh, an American, I uh, in fact, let me look up his name here. Uh, his surname is Moffat. Um, I think he may be with the Smithsonian, but we'd have to check that out. Uh, he's certainly a researcher. Um, Mark Moffat, in fact. There you go. He fed a carrot to a giant wetter on a recent visit he made to um, Little Barrier Island. And, and the picture of this wetter munching on the carrot, which I have to say is terribly cute, has made international news. And so with all the hoo-ha um, local, well, New Zealand insect expert and, and self-confessed uh, bug man root Kleinpasta has said that, you know, it's actually just not that significant. Well, it's not as significant as everybody makes out. Um, although they are endangered on, on the islands in which they live, there are thousands of them. Uh, you can find them on Little Barrier Island and Motu, uh, Motuora Island. And, and so, you know, great, but it seems that it needed to be an American who saw it for it to mean anything. He also points out that uh, this wasn't, although Wetapunga, so these giant Weta, are the heaviest insects in the world, and the heaviest one ever recorded was 72 grams. Um, the 71 gram specimen that Moffat says he found was only 71. So just a cautionary tale there, I guess, for for our listeners all over the world, is um, 
Yeah, be beware, particularly when it comes to enormous findings of great new things. It's possible the locals already knew about it. <laughs> it doesn't mean that weirdos aren't noteworthy, though. Oh, they can no, do some incredible things, oh, like being frozen in suspended animation and then uh, reanimated again. Oh, absolutely. I mean, they're fantastic creatures. They remind me a lot uh, growing up in South Africa. We had a, something called a Parktown prawn, which, which also inspired fear in many people. Uh, it was a little bit smaller, though, but also sort of unusual and confined to very small geographical regions. Okay. Mm. Also, speaking of, of weird and wacky creatures, Amy, I think you have something rather inter interesting for us again. I do, I do. Um, so, again, talking about the citizen science and, and getting people to, to be involved in the scientific process, after the last few years, there's been a lot of uh, sort of crowdsourced science happening, things like Galaxy Zoo. Um, and what has been happening is that uh, stereograms or sounds or, or pictures, for example, with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey are being produced at enormous rates, and scientists need help in going through these thousands or tens of thousands of images or whatever um, and classifying them. And in the Galaxy Zoo example, it's led to a number of uh, new discoveries, such as the Green P galaxies, for example, um, and Hannes Vorvap, or, or Anis Vorvap. Um, it's great because it means anybody who wants to be involved can be involved. And there are a number of things like this. You, you now get Foldit, which is all about uh, folding proteins. There's been some big news about that recently. Um, and it's spreading into a number of other different types of, of, of science as well, stuff around DNA. It's, it's great. Now, the newest example of this is an uh, an initiative from Scientific American and Last.fm, the online streaming radio station people of all things, and it's called Whale FM. Um, if you go to uh, whale.fm, that, that's a good place to start. And it's just fantastic. What they've done is they've taken hundreds and hundreds of, of sound recordings of pilot whales and orca whales, um, or, or killer whales, as some people like to call them. Um, pilot whales and, and orcas are actually both types of dolphins, but yes. And they need help classifying them. It, it, it appears that the communication between these animals is, is quite complicated. There are hundreds of different sounds. But scientists once again need help sort of trying to, you know, categorize all these recordings that they've taken and try and match them into groups that make sense together. So what they've done is they've started Well.fm, where you can go online, you, you get a recording, you can see the stereogram of it, so the, the shape the sound makes, which means it's great for people who are visual, people who, you know, sort of more auditorily inclined. Um, and then you get a list of other sounds that it might or might not be like, and you choose the one that it is most like. And the idea is that if they get, you know, the results of lots and lots and lots of people put together, it'll it'll iron out sort of, you know, any major errors and inconsistencies in terms of, you know, maybe somebody had a cold one day or, or uh, one of the examples given is that some of the very high sounds are actually in frequencies that many adults battle to hear. Um, and, and, and hopefully this will allow them to uh, uh, better understand how these whales are communicating. Of course, one of the big issues being that it is the thought that um, human communication and even just sort of boat traffic and ship traffic, for example, may be disrupting the communication of, of these other marine mammals. Which is really sad, it considering is. how gorgeous their song is, Absolutely. and how long-lived the songs can be, and mm -hmm. how far travelled they used to be before we started polluting the oceans. Yeah. Extraneous noise. Indeed, but but certainly, and if you like whale song, you know this is a brilliant way of a Saturday or a Sunday afternoon to sit down, be involved in science, and do something cool for the dolphins. I love that we live in a society where you can tune into a radio station and listen to whales. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, do do go and check that out. I started playing with it earlier today, and and had to put it down before it became an obsession. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, so somewhat of an obsession from mine was picked up uh, by an award uh, by the uh, Science Journal, or the journal called Science, uh, this week. What it is, it's called Open Source Physics. It's a, a project, um, and you can visit this for free. It's www.compadre.org slash OSP. And this is an open source educational resource for physics. It takes you through a bunch of different uh, visual representations of things like the phases of the moon, to orbits, to anything else you can imagine. And what they're doing is they're not only just putting together a bunch of open source resources for physics, is they're putting through tutorials and an actual curriculum to teach anyone that's interested for free um, all the 
principles that computational physics uses. And this stuff is just amazing. Now I'm I don't do much computational physics in my day to day work, but the little I do do is based on uh, is based on Python, and I've used Tracker, which is a video analysis software in um, in the past and they use both of these to great effect and this is just really cool to see that everyone can contribute to something like this and everyone can learn from it as well which is uh, another big uh, big soapbox issue of mine that I just love to see that this is being made freely available and the authors of the paper their names are uh, Wolfgang Christian Francisco S. Yeah, I pronounced that wrong. Uh, and Lyle Barbato, I uh, have all won a prize called the Spore Prize. Now it's not the Spore Computer Game Prize. It actually stands for da, 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 Science Prize for Online Resources in Education. And it looks like this is a fantastic website with a whole bunch of different resources. So I'm really excited to see this and to see where it goes in the future. I've certainly learned a lot from it already. Yeah, it sounds just amazing. And, and once again, you know. This sort of stuff's great for, for, I mean, people, let's say, in the third world who have a difficulty of access to, you know, top-notch universities or schools, um, but also for, for people, let's say, who, you know, too young in school for their teachers to be covering that, or who've since left school and, and maybe don't have the time or the money or the, even the inclination to go back to university, but might still, you know, find that, that this really clicks with them and it's something they like knowing about and, and can potentially even be useful uh, with. Yeah, it's going to be very cool. I can promise you that. <laughs> awesome, awesome stuff. Um, 